organized by the Office of Public Relations and the Department of Economics. I'd like to welcome each one of you and hope you all enjoy this evening and have a lot to take back from our esteemed speaker for the day, Dr. Vandana Shiva, environmental activist and a food sovereignty advocate. Tell me and I forget. Teach me and I may remember. Involve me and I learn. This is the integrated education one receives at St. Joseph's College, which focuses on freedom of inquiry, freedom of discussion, and freedom of teaching. We will now have an introduction video to introduce St. Joseph's College to you all. Thank you. Welcome to St. Joseph's College. This is a 137 year old college. Currently, the college is home to over 6,000 students at undergraduate and master's as well as research level. The college is also home to a diversity of cultures from all over the country, from Northeast, South, East, West, Central, you know, all over the country. Besides, of course, a good number of students coming from uh, across the border and overseas. Jesuits run a lot of universities across the world. St. Joseph's College Bangalore has studied a lot of university structures in the country, as well as some of the leading universities in the world. One such leader, very successful, innovative, and a visionary, is Professor Kiran Jeevan, the PRO of the college and also professor at the Department of Social Work. He is also the brain behind the inspirational lecture series. I'd like to invite him to introduce the inspirational lecture series to us. Good evening. Uh, the inspirational lecture series was envisioned by the PRO's office to showcase students' stories of peace and justice, of commitment, of struggle, and of joy. We are living in difficult times, and all we need today are stories that could inspire us and strengthen us. And that is the reason why the PRO's office has envisioned this project of the Inspirational Lecture Series. A warm welcome to all of you. Thank you, Professor Kiran, and we'd like to wish you all the best for all the plans ahead.
If your actions create a legacy that inspires others to dream more, do more, become more, and what you do has far greater impact than what you say, you truly are an inspiration. We have the most inspirational speaker for today to begin the inspirational lecture series, a true inspiration to the world, Dr. Vandana Shiva. I call upon the HOD of economics, Professor Anita Narona, to introduce our speaker for the day and invite her to address the gathering. Thank you, Professor Lata. It gives me immense pleasure this evening to introduce my esteemed speaker, Dr. Vandana Shiva. Dr. Vandana Shiva is an Indian scholar, environmental activist, food sovereignty advocate, and anti-globalization author. Based in Delhi, she has authored more than 20 books. Dr. Shiva is one of the leaders and board members of the International Forum on Globalization and a figure of the anti-globalization movement. She is a member of the scientific committee of the Foundation Ideas, which is Spain's socialist party's think tank. She is also a member of the International Organization for a Participatory Society. She has received the Right Livelihood Award in 1993 an award established by the Swedish German philanthropist Jakob Born, and it is regarded as an alternative Nobel Prize. Dr. Vandana Shiva has written and spoken extensively about advances in the fields of agriculture and food, intellectual property rights, biodiversity, biotechnology, bioethics, and genetic engineering are among the fields where Dr. Shiva has fought through activist campaigns. She has assisted grassroots organizations of the Green Movement in Africa, Asia, Latin America, Ireland, Switzerland, and Austria with opposition to advances in agricultural development via genetic engineering. Ma'am, it is such a great pleasure to have you this evening with us with the first inspirational lecture series. Thank you immensely for taking time off your busy schedule. And on behalf of the rector, Father Principal, the registrar, the PR office, and the Department of Economics, I welcome you and invite you to deliver the lecture. Over to you, ma'am. My greetings to all of you in Bangalore at St. Joseph's. And when I was looking at that video, my mind was going back to 79 when I used to be in the Indian Institute of Management at Bangalore, which had its offices in the St. Joseph's building on Langford Road. So that stone building is a very familiar place for me. And Dr. Enas Ramaswamy, who's no more, called the Cartman, is the one with whom I worked. And uh, he had created a science and technology policy division. Now I was very keen to understand why it was that if we are always taught that science removes poverty, we have the third biggest scientific community of the world. And yet we have the largest number of extremely poor people and the most extreme hunger and malnutrition in the world. And how did it hang together? Uh, I remember very clearly my days in Bangalore, we managed to create a social involvement program for the students. And I used to bring them to my home, the Garhwali Malaya, where I had been a volunteer as a student with the Chipko movement. And the students used to come to visit Chipko, to visit the leaders, to visit Sundalal Bahuguna, visit Silyara Ashram. And in 81, of course, we got a logging ban. I left in 82 to come back to my home in Dehradun and start the Research Foundation for Science, Technology and Ecology. And it's very interesting because of the lockdown, I am back in my childhood home. My mother gifted me her cow shed when I was thinking of doing work for the earth and for community. And we had done a short study which had stopped the mining in Dune Valley and I said, if a six month study can save an entire valley, if I dedicate my entire life to the protection of the earth and acting in service of communities for justice and peace, um, so much more. 
I live my life. And so mother said, don't even hesitate, take the cow shed. So the little office I'm sitting in was my mother's cow shed. Behind me is an Einstein I sculpted in the short break I had between finishing my MSc or honors in particle physics from the University of Punjab and before taking on a PhD, initially in India, and then I went to Canada to do a PhD in the foundations of quantum theory. And between Chipko and my PhD, I learned very, very early the lessons of non-separation and non-separability. The lessons that everything has a potential, nothing is fixed. The lesson of uncertainty and indeterminism. And most importantly, the lesson that there is no excluded middle. There is no either or. There is no, if you're not like me, you're my enemy to be exterminated. In the quantum world, that doesn't exist. In our ecological civilization, where we say, Vasudeva Kutumbakam, thinking that someone is close to me and someone is distant, someone is above me and someone is less, this is not India's civilization. And when I talk about Earth democracy, I am basically bringing to contemporary articulation this ancient concept, not just empty words, but a lived reality to address the multiple emergencies that we are living through. We're all living through a continued semi-lockdown. COVID has totally shut down the world. Climate havoc, look at the floods of Karnataka this year. Karnataka is a rain-fed semi-arid tract. Those regions are not supposed to be flooded. The Western Ghats have the best clothing of rainforests. And the Chipko movement was taken by my little young colleague at that time, Pandurang Hegde of Sirsi, and he started the Apiko movement, the Chipko of the South. And we stopped dams and we stopped mining. And as long as the forests are there on the mountains, whether it's the Himalaya or it's the Western Ghats, we are protected because we get heavy monsoon. If they're forests, monsoons are a gift. If the forests have gone, the monsoons are a curse. My Chipko sisters who'd never ever been to school knew this at a time where the scientists were totally ignorant. They knew that the forest destruction was leading to floods, was leading to droughts, was leading to landslides. And they said, we are going to come out and hug the trees. You'll have to kill us before you kill the trees. That's what the word Chipko means. So my life started with Chipko as a volunteer while I was still a student in the early 70s when it started. And the idea of non-separation was reinforced that, you know, in, in typical reductionist, mechanistic, predatory science, a forest is a timber mine. And all you measure is the extraction you can take. And in those early days, I used to do a lot of writings on the forest question. And there were forestry experts who used to say, everything else in the forest is clearly weeds. It's only the commercial timber. And I remember in Bangalore, while I was with the Indian Institute of Management in the old building, which is your St. Joseph's College, I was very puzzled by the fact that around Bangalore, the farms were being overtaken by eucalyptus cultivation. And I said, why are people planting eucalyptus? We did a big study, 13% of the land was now planted by eucalyptus. Did a little more work and found out there was an institution called the World Bank. I didn't know there was a World Bank, I'd been busy with physics. And I always say, I found the World Bank, this giant institution, the biggest bank in the world, hiding behind the eucalyptus tree. It had given a loan called social forestry. Now, social forestry was the word we created through Chipko, that forests should be for the earth, ecological, and they should be for society. And they took this word and said, now, not only have you destroyed the forest by growing monocultures, we will now destroy the farms by growing eucalyptus rather than ragi. So we did this big study of IAM and, uh, 
and my love for ragi of mandua my love for the pongemia the honge my love knowledge then began then and there used to be a very very important retired unfao official who had come to i am bangalore to give a talk and i'll never forget this because he gave a talk on the different kind of vadas that karnataka and mysore used to have he talked about 60 kind of vadas so i realized the forests have diversity our fields have diversity but india's foods have so much diversity and this is the diversity that holds us when we don't come together that holds the earth together and it's the assault on this diversity that is at the root of the pandemic it's at the root of climate change it's at the root of extinction and it's the root of social breakdown and polarization of society let me take each one of these aspects one at a time how diversity holds the earth and society together and the assault on diversity destroys the fabric of the earth and it destroys the fabric of society so why do we have the pandemic i wrote a piece literally the day i had to rush back when the lockdown was announced flights were being cancelled and i didn't want to be stuck in europe so i rushed back and uh, on the flight back i wrote my essay you can find this essay on the navdania website i welcome you all to visit this website i welcome the students particularly to look at the earth university pages so you can start applying for courses physically come to dehradun when you can but meantime sign up for the zoom courses and if you can't be present at the time of the course we will record it for you and play it for you so do go to the uh, do go to the earth university website you can also write to the earth university at navdania.net email all the details will be on the website but i also have a blog on life on jeevan and so i wrote this piece on reflections on the corona virus and realize we are one planet and one health and when we destroy the planet we destroy our health so of the 300 new infectious diseases that don't have a prior history in humanity all created in the last 30 years of globalization so i was introduced because that's what the wikipedia page about me which is manufactured by young people who are paid to try and fabricate my person um they remove everything significant and, and leave a few sentences so i'm defined as an anti globalization activist no i'm a lover of life and defender of life and it's because the rules of free trade are an assault on life and they're an assault on freedom that i've questioned them the first free trade agreement was written by the east india company to basically get an uneven playing field and take over india 1716 for the students who are interested in economics and the students who are interested in history go look for the farooq sheer farman with the right honorable east india company 500 rupees bribe and they got free trade empire over india 19 95 was when wto was established but it started as gat in the late 70s and this is a very important story to tell you so i was invited to uh, a meeting on the new biotechnologies i'm talking of 1987 i've done a book on the green revolution because punjab the state where i done my msc honors in physics when it was very peaceful in the 70s was now erupting in violence in 84 the golden temple had to have the army sent that even that um this uh, november indira gandhi was assassinated that same year the bhopal tragedy took ha- ha- happen and i was working then on a united nations program on peace and global transformation on a on a particular part of it called conflicts over resources those were the days when we were creating apico and we were helping the narmada movement grow all this was part of the participatory action research i had designed 
And when Punjab erupted in 84, I wrote to the United Nations University in Tokyo. I said, something serious is going on here and I would like to study it. And they gave me permission. And, um, and that book called The Violence of the Green Revolution, which is available in India from Natraj Publishers, was published um, with a gap because, you know, writing on Punjab also became a problem at that time. But UNU published it initially. And I realized then that Punjab's agriculture was destroyed for chemicals. Punjab used to grow 250 crop varieties, a species. And then it was growing rice in one season and wheat in one season. And then the entire system was created so that everyone had to get that rice and wheat. And now the recent laws up to which I'll come back, the, what are called farm bills, but I, acts, but I would call them food acts, are basically saying, okay, you know, we enslave the farmers, now let's dismantle it and hand it over to the corporations. So having done that book, I was invited to this meeting in Geneva in Bojib on the new biotechnologies for laws of life. And this is where I first heard about GATT and free trade and the companies wanting to have an international trade agreement to own the seed. These were the same companies that had brought us Bhopal, same companies that had worked for Hitler as IG Farben to create chemicals to kill people in concentration camps. And now they were saying, we will own life. We will do genetic engineering to take patents and own life and we'll force this on the world. And by the end of the meeting, I was initially scared. I said, when five companies, and they said, we'll be five. I said, when five companies control all life on earth, what kind of a world is it? That's when I started to write about bioimperialism, biopolitics, and started to save seats and started the Navdanya movement to save seats. Three things I said at the meeting, but it stayed with me. I said, but you don't invent life. Life is part of the flow of creation. It's part of the flow of evolution. It's not a machine. How can you say you can have a patent on it because a patent is taken on an invention and this is not an invention. So I questioned them there, but I came back to India Started Navdanya, I said, no matter what happens, I do save seeds. And I started to create community seed banks. And we've created 150 community seed banks across India. One of the early ones I started, I said Bangalore, because I was still coming back to Bangalore after the initial stages of leaving. The second thing I said is, I'm going to go to Geneva and work with my embassy to make sure that the trade-related intellectual property rights agreement of GATT does not have a forcing of patenting, which is Monsanto's intention. As they wrote, we were the patient, physician, and diagnostician all in one. We defined a problem, and the problem they defined was farmers have seeds and farmers save seeds. And the diagnostics was it should be made a crime for farmers to save seeds. And as doctors, they said, Let's have intellectual property rights and seed. So I started to go to Geneva and we had a wonderful ambassador, S.P. Shukla. And I started to talk to him. And I said, you've got to have an exception. He worked to bring A, an exclusion that countries can exclude from patentability, plants and animals from patentability, and he put a sui generis option. As a result of which, there are two laws that we were able to shape in this country. Very important laws that will be a gift to you all of the future generations. The first is the law on patents. Article 3J of the patent law in India clearly says, plants, animals, and seeds are not human inventions. Therefore, they are not patentable. And even though Monsanto did try and claim ownership, I remember I've been back to Bangalore two or three times to fight cases on Monsanto's lies. And we had their case dismissed when they wanted to assert ownership to collect royalties. The second law, very important law, Article 39 of the Plant Varieties Protection and uh, Farmers' Rights Act. Now, you know, in those days, we had ministers and parliamentarians who really used to accept 
and used to read papers and figure out. So Chaturanand Mishra, the minister, called me and said, my, um, my government officials are telling me we have to have the plant variety law to hand over monopolies to the international seed industry. But you keep saying, no. I said, because we've got so generous system in trips, we can make another law. And I had made a draft law. And I said, farmers are the first breeders in India. At that time, 80% of the seed was in farmers' hands. So we can write laws. And he invited me with Shuklaji to write the law in which Article 39 says, farmers' right to save, exchange, breed, improve, sell seed can never be alienated. So last year, Pepsi sued four farmers, three crores, for saving potato seeds. Because, you know, Pepsi potatoes and chips make you sick and give you diabetes. Please, I beg of you, stop using those products. Not good for you, not good for the planet. All the trash is because of packaged food. You can be a big player of a protection of your health and the protection of the planet. I sent the book I have, it's called Origin. And it's my 35 years of work on biodiversity, including intellectual property rights, including every case I ever fought on biopiracy, the biopiracy of neem, the biopiracy of basmati, the biopiracy of wheat. It's documented every law of this land and it's documented every international law of which I've been a part of. Origin, the plunder, corporate plunder of nature and culture. It is really, if you want to understand what's happening in the world, read that book, order that book. So I send this book to the lawyers who shared it with the judges and Pepsi's case could not go through, they had to withdraw it. If we didn't have Article 39 of the Farmers Rights Act, Pepsi would be suing farmers left, right, and center. But coming back to the issue of the health of the planet, our health being one. So globalization has created a food system that is very, very wasteful. I learned this in my study of the Green Revolution, but I have done this work now since 1984, 36 years of deep study. I've written about 10 books just on food and agriculture. And this wasteful system produces less food, produces bad food and invades into the forest. It's an invasive system to grow monocultures of a few commodities at very high cost. Approve the farmers, destroy the soil, destroy the water, destroy the biodiversity, destroy the climate and destroy your health. So why are these 300 new infectious diseases being created? Because Humanity under globalization and limitless greed and not knowing when to stop is invading into forest ecosystems. Invasion into forest ecosystems means that viruses that are part of, uh, you know, that are safe, are part of the biome and virome of animals in the forest, now start becoming infections for the human being. There's a case in Karnataka and it's very thoroughly studied, it's called the monkey disease, that everywhere where this cortical disease comes up is around where deforestation has happened. And it's, it jumps from monkeys to human beings. Ebola, HIV, SARS, Nile virus, all deforestation viruses. The cause is our attack on nature. The symptom is the virus. The symptom is not the but a symptom is not the cause. The virus is a result of human greed and irresponsibility. And, you know, now the UN has recognized that everyone in the pandemic is looking at symptoms. But we should be looking at the cause, which is our relationship with the earth, which is respect for nature, which is leaving the homes of indigenous people and animals for them. How can a, a tiny elite try and want the last forest, the last drop of water, the last inch of land, and snatch it from other beings, snatch it from other farmers, snatch it from tribals and indigenous people. So the pandemic is very much a part of an ecological crisis. And my essay, One Planet, One Health, goes into the depth of it. But it also went into the depth that people, you know, it's not that you get an infection, you die. You get an infection if your immunity is strong, nothing happens to you. 
you get an infection, but you've been eating that horrible Pepsi junk chips and drinking Pepsi and Coke, then you have a very vulnerable body. You have a metabolic disorder. You have diabetes. If you have diabetes, the risk of dying is 9.2%. If toxics in the food have given you cancer, the risks of your dying are 7.6%. Whereas the normal mortality risk is 0.5 to 1% with corona. So first, this globalized food system attacks the forest, but it also attacks your bodies. So all disease, avoidable disease is because of a globalized industrial food system based on chemicals. Climate change, I have a book called Soil Not Oil. 2009, I was going to Copenhagen for the climate summit, and I realized that while our work in India was showing that not only is chemicals a source of emissions, but we, we could see that organic farming and biodiversity is the solution. So I decided to write this book, Soil Not Oil, also available in India. I think Soil Not Oil is available from Women Unlimited. Um, I'll be very happy later to... Uh, have a, a list of the books sent, though you might, you will be able to remember it from this talk. So at that point, I had come to the conclusion that about 45% of greenhouse gas emissions come from an industrial system of food production. The figures are about 12 to 18% because of the way food is produced. The fossil fuels, the giant tractors, the combined harvesters, huge fossil fuel use, but all chemicals of agriculture are fossil fuel based. One kilogram of urea uses two liters of diesel. It's a fossil fuel system. And then it emits a nitrous oxide that goes into the atmosphere, which is 300 times more damaging for the climate than carbon dioxide. Then you have what is called land use change. But this is the invasion into the forest. All of Indonesian forests are for palm oil. Amazon is being totally destroyed for soya bean. That is responsible for up to 18% of emissions. And then when you take, you know, if I grow a good carrot in my garden and I eat it, fine. Or if I have put, you know, when I was in Bangalore, I was living in Basangudi. And I remember those tiny little uh, shops where we used to buy you know, coffee for just that week. The bread for just that day. And if you were late, the bread was so fresh, they'd run out. And the lovely mixtures were, and fresh chips. They gave employment to women. They gave us health. Lace chips have to have bad oil, lots of fat, lots and lots of salt, lots and lots of preservatives. These are not edible products. They are recipes for sickness. The package, that horrible aluminum in which every chip's packet comes, comes from mining for bauxite. I have worked with lots of tribals, including Niamgiri, who wanted to stop the Niamgiri mining of bauxite by Vedanta. But every packet of chips, just think of it. When you eat a packet of chips, think of the farmer who grew the potato who's being sued by Pepsi. When you eat a potato chip, think of the women's groups who made good chips, who lost their employment. When you eat a packet of chips, think of the tribals who lost their home for that box out. When you eat a packet of chips, think of your health and your body and give it respect. You know, our body is supposed to be sacred body. And here we are destroying our health. And this processing and packaging and long distance transport, add it all, it's 20% of greenhouse gases. And then when you cultivate uniformity in the field and you create long distance systems, you have 4% food waste. And here we are, which comes eat methane. Add it all up, we are talking about 50% greenhouse gases, 75% water destruction, 75% devastation of soil. Uh, you all should become very active because when I worked on the eucalyptus project for the IM Bangalore, we realized one of the reasons it was spreading is Mr. Devraj Ars 
had created an amazing land reform law. And that's why all the land holdings of Karnataka are small land holdings. There's been an attempt to change that land law and, uh, and push it into large 200 acre, 500 acre farms, which will spray round up, have giant combined harvesters. The fragile soils of the Deccan cannot handle the violence of the agriculture that is the kind of practice in, in, in the United States and in America. That's not agriculture. It's a continuation of war. And because I had worked on the Green Revolution, when the GATT and WTO started and all of this, I started to travel the country and visit tribals, visit farmers, to tell them about these intellectual property rights laws. There was a jungle draft text, which we used to call DDT. The text had been leaked. So with this text, I would travel the country. And I remember coming to Karnataka and training the Karnataka Raj Raj Sangha. And then we organized, 92 we organized rallies, 93 we organized rallies. 93 we organized a 500,000 people rally in Kaban Park, where I brought leaders of agriculture movements from around the world. And we said agriculture and food is too important for the life of the planet and our life and health and the livelihoods of farmers to be left to free trade, to be controlled by five trading giants, five chemical giants, five food processing giants. And now I would add two e-commerce giants, the Walmarts and the Amazons. If you leave food to their hands, they're going to give you junk. They're going to destroy our farmers. And this is the context of globalization, which I critiqued. We stopped WTO in Seattle. We shut it down. And in fact, since then, WTO has been, as they say, in intensive care. The director general has left to join Pepsi. That's how unregulated the world trade is. Now, at this time, we have a pandemic. We know during the pandemic, only local food systems supported people. During the pandemic, long distance supply chains collapsed. Why would India want to enter a failed system at a time of vulnerability? So, you know, in 91, the World Bank had tried to impose a structural adjustment on India. My study then showed that one third of the $90 billion debt was for green revolution, chemicals, dams, irrigation, etc. And now they wanted us to change agriculture. They wanted to remove essential commodities act. They wanted to undo land reform and keep land in, in the hands of small peasants. And interestingly, all my research and all FAO research is showing small farms produce more food. And 80% of the food, according to the UNU, um, according to the UN, FAO, comes from small farms. These large farms don't feed anybody. They produce biofuel and animal feed. They wanted to remove the stock holding that is in the APMCs, the Mundis, have a limit to how much a trader can hold. The Mundis, quite contrary to the media propaganda, are not trader driven. The Mundis are cooperative. Look at the Karnataka APMC Act. The committee of the Mundi has farmers, farmers cooperatives, and traders groups. I remember in, in Bangalore itself, there's so many farmers markets run by these committee, committees and these cooperatives. They wanted to remove regulation of prices. They wanted to get rid of every regulatory process. Now, because we've had an active parliament, we had very, very active democracy, we managed to stop most of those things. The only things that wasn't stopped was policy decisions on import and exports, because those are executive decisions. But anything that needed a change in law, we stopped it. What we stopped from 91 to 2020 was passed with the three acts that have just been passed during the pandemic. One act is a rem removal of food from the Essential Commodities Act. And I tell you what happens when price of food is not right, you get riots. 
what is called the Arab Spring were bread riots. They were just called the Arab Spring, but people were fighting for bread because food had become a speculative commodity and where governments were not controlling the price, it was going beyond people's reach. As I mentioned, the APMCs were designed to make sure farmers didn't get exploited and the country had affordable food. This is what supports the entire PDS system, the entire FCI system. If 1.3 billion people are eating today, it's because of that regulatory system. That gets dismantled. And this gets dismantled at a time where more and more giant corporations are entering the food system. The curd that is introduced is a contract farming law with an unsigned big assumption that small farms are not viable. Small farms are the only economically viable uh, system. And I want to read out to you what our, uh, you know, a, a former, uh, our prime minister, um, Jodhri Charan Singh, who was both a farmer and an economist had said, he said, if I have a hundred acres and I, as a prime minister, I will give those hundred acres to 10 farmers because those 10 farmers will grow much more food for me. I will never let a hundred acres be in the hand of one farmer. The former prime minister, agricultural economist, practicing farmer. All of my research in the last 36 years shows smaller the farm, the more it produces in nutrition per acre, not yield per acre. Yield is nutritionally empty commodities. It produces more because it has an ingredient that large farms cannot bring. Large farms can bring more chemicals. Large farms can bring more, for more fossil fuels. Large farms can bring more violence. Large farms cannot bring care and love. It's the small farm that is a farm of care. And so I work very, very closely with the process of the Lord Auto Sea. And I was to have gone in March for a, a conference for young people on the economy of St. Francis. St. Francis had said, only in giving you receive. This is the economy of the law of return. This is the economy of the gift. And on the small farm, you can practice this economy. I give some organic matter to the soil, soil gives me more food. The soil creates soil organisms. I grow more crops in my field with love and care and intensity. I have more food, the butterflies might have more food, the pollinators have more food, and they give me more food. The web of life is a food web. The care for life is care through food. And care through food means we must care for the earth. It means we must care for our farmers and realize that each of us as a consumer has a responsibility to join the movement of small farmers to defend their livelihoods. And finally, you have to care for your health and your bodies. Food is where it all begins. We have a book called Anna, where food as health, the top public health experts, the top Ayurvedic people of this country and the Navdanya team have written this. We grow biodiversity and our research is showing the more biodiversity you have, the more food you have, the more nutrition you have, the more butterflies you have, the more soil organisms you have, the happier people you have, the more prosperous farmers you have, our farmers are earning 10 times more. The contract farming is justified on doubling farm incomes. Doesn't tell you whether it'll be net income or gross, it'll be gross, not net. Net will be negative, negative, negative. Our farmers net income 10 times more because they have their own seed, they have their own ecological inputs, they are sovereign in their market through relationships without either the small middlemen or the giant middlemen which are the big companies. You are entering this world in this period of multiple emergencies, you can either think, oh my God, what do I do about it? I'm helpless. Or look around you and say, where is it that I get hope? Where can I join a movement for the protection of creation, the sowing the seeds of justice and peace? How can I, with my special place in life, be part of a new earth democracy where the earth thrives, our freedom thrives, and all beings are happy and well. Thank you. Uh, Ma'am, you truly set the path uh, for our lecture series by your delivering the first lecture 
just by being an inspiration to us by walking the talk and all your engagements in society with protecting our mother earth how diversity holds the earth and society and how the assault on diversity destroys the fabric and how we all need to begin to respect nature and you also set a very hopeful uh, call to all our students to be part of such movements and i think that is important when we begin to question and we begin to take a stand so thank you for that ma'am and i'm sure you are an inspiration to many and uh, will continue to be in a long time and surely your talk has awakened the minds and spirits of all those who are present here today and definitely they have a lot of questions i now hand over uh, to moderate the question question and answer session to dr padmaja pancharatnam and professor treza joy from the department of economics thank you thank you ma'am for your inspiring lecture and it's been an honor to listen to you let's begin with the first question what do you see uh, what do you think are the key challenges for india going forward with regard to establishing food security while also ensuring our food sovereignty well you know food sovereignty is the only way to ensure food security yeah mm -hmm. uh, food sovereignty means you are self reliant you are art nirbhar in deciding what you'll grow how you'll grow it and how it will be distributed that is true art nirbhar that is self reliance in 1942 we had the last bengal famine uh Uta Patnai has done amazing work. She wrote a book called Republic Hunger, but she's done a new book in um, in, in an economic volume. Uh, I'm just looking for it, uh, and she has worked out that during British rule, forty-five trillion dollars were transferred from India from the peasants who were left in such poverty that they were driven to famine, and sixty million people died. So British. got 45 trillion indian peasants paid for it through their very lives we had lost food sovereignty then so the first essays gandhi wrote in one of his first speeches after independence was we have to become self reliant on food and and he said we are a nation that's rich in soils rich in rivers rich in knowledge ecological agriculture organic farming it all gone to india there's a book called an agricultural testament which is called the bible of modern organic farming 1905 the british sent their specialist here to improve indian agriculture and set up the pusa institute he says the soils are fertile there are no pests damaging the crops i have to make the indian peasant and the pest my professor on how to good, do good farming and his book the agricultural testament is how to do good farming which is a documentation of how we did farming so gandhi replied put all this together and said there's no reason why we should have hunger and famine so food sovereignty is the basis of food security now new liberalism same year 91 you know 91 is when narasimha rao uh, you know um, rajiv was assassinated during election campaigning in tamil nadu and then narasimha rao became uh, the, the prime minister but during campaigning narasimha rao gave a speech in karnataka I remember this so clearly. He said, "Food security is not food in your go downs, but dollars in your pockets." And re I remember the women of Dharwad telling him, "But <laughs> we don't have pockets; we wear saris, and we don't have dollars; we have rupees." Now, this idea of food security—that you can you sell what you grow and you buy what you need—is economically dysfunctional. I've done a study again in Karnataka. we were told by the world bank stop growing grain same bank that said grow wheat and rice in punjab now said don't grow grain grow flowers for export grow vegetables for export grow meat for export and have shrimp for export that is their recipe so they financed industrial aquaculture along the coast devastated the coast they actually financed the export of beef india became the biggest beef exporting nation because of world bank recipes I did a study on floriculture in Karnataka. One farm took the water of five villages, and then we did an economic calculation. The flowers exported. How much could you buy for its value? You could only buy twenty-five percent of the food you would have grown if you'd used the land and water. 
to grow food in India. So food security is not food sovereignty. Food sovereignty is having your seed sovereignty, beet swaraj we call it, having your own food, your indigenous crops. Your, you know, I would like the, the St. Joseph's community to join me in a big program and movement to, you know, we, Navdanya has worked to bring the millets back. 33 years ago, I started to save millets. We call them forgotten foods. These are future foods. This is food sovereignty. The, uh, you know, let me come back to biodiversity. Not only diversity good for the earth, not only is diversity good for society, diversity is the only way to fight totalitarianism and total control over the economy. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, this question I forgot to mention was by, was asked by Sanjay Balan from St. Joseph's College. Now we'll move on to another question from Dr. Maulia from Mani Manipal University. In the process of development, tribe, tribes have been evacuated and shifted to er areas for, for a better living. What does this mean? Do you think it means development? <laughs> So, you know, I would suggest to all of you to read a book um, we wrote. You know, Ivan Illich, you might, some of you might have heard him, but so many might have forgotten who he was. Amazing thinker. In fact, originally he was a Jesuit priest. Ivan had a group around him, and we wrote a development dictionary edited by Wolfgang Sachs, and I have an essay on, on it in resources. And as we've written in this development dictionary, the word development is a biological term. Each of you as an adult is a developed version of the fetus that was in your mother's womb. The fetus becoming an adult is development. I sow a seed, it becomes a plant. That's development. Development is self-organized generation from within, structurally consistent, but constantly changing. What is called economic development is externally imposed it is money making money. World Bank gives $1 and generates $3 of business for the companies for whom it gets the contracts. This is extraction. It is not development. So when you, you know, I've done so many studies now on the World Bank. They forced Maharashtra to grow sugarcane in an arid zone, in a rain shadow zone. Maharashtra is a water famine now. They said, we will not give you a loan for water, uh, for wells, unless you grow sugarcane and stop your, your jwar and bajra and, and, and your native crops, which are water prudent. So they give money to make money. But in the process, displacement takes place. They give money to make dams. They give money for mines. Displacement is not development. Displacement is uprooting by violence. It is violent. So we need to bring development back to its ecological and biological meaning and describe economics in honest terms. When extraction is happening, we should call it extraction. When giving is happening, we should talk about it as the economy of giving. It's circular, living circular economies, I call it. I think economics, need, I think most people don't realize that economics is a child of colonialism, yeah? East India Company defined commerce, and then it defined the disciplines of commerce, and this became economics. So we are teaching economics on the basis of what is good for the colonizer, not what is good for the earth or for communities. It needs a big re revisit, and for those of you who are part of the St. Joseph's community, I would suggest read Lord Artusee, because I was part of the team that was called to the Vatican to do the chapters on redefining the eco global economy, overcoming the economics of indifference. Amazing thinking, you know, it tells you exactly how wrong our thinking is. And we should not, and my, and my new book called Oneness Versus 1% is about how we have taken illusions and constructs that have been, be been imposed by powerful people and made them natural. That women are inferior, blacks are inferior, People are poor because they deserve to be poor. The rich are rich because they are meritorious. I think all of these things have to be revisited, <coughs> both from the deep ecological civilization that India is, from the amazing different traditions and the best of ecological science. 
that teaches you that life is self-organization and evolution. Thank you, ma'am. And we'd like, we'd like to end with a final question on what is, what, is what, are, what are your current projects right now? That's asked by Madhumita Ravindra, a student from SJC. And also a lot of people are interested in knowing what inspires you to have chosen the fields that you have and what motivates you. What is the third bit? What motivates you? Oh, what motivates me? Okay. <clears throat> Let me begin from the end. What mo motivates me is love. Love for the earth, love for creation, love for people around me, love for humanity at large. That's what motivates me. And why do I choose the fields in which I work? When I see harm, when I see injustice, I like the old Chipko movement where they say, we're going to hug the trees, you'll have to kill us before you kill the trees. My life has been throwing myself into a field with my love to say you will not cause harm. So when I saw what happened in Bhopal and Punjab in 84, I threw myself to agriculture and said, no, I'll cultivate a non-violent, compassionate farming. And that's what I've done since 84. When I saw the Monsanto say we'll own life, patent life, take away farmers' seeds, take away farmers' rights, I threw myself to saving seeds. Now I'm seeing all of the billionaires, all the tech barons, you know, they've made so much money. In America, they've transferred 50 trillion. If the British transferred 45 trillion from India to England, the billionaires of America have transferred 50 trillion from the people to themselves. During the lockdown, Jeff Bezos made 67 billion additional dollars by making everyone dependent on home delivery. I really do request, if you care for justice, do not order, unless it's absolutely unavoidable, please do not order your groceries. Go to the markets. Bangalore has such beautiful markets. Please do not make Amazon and Walmart your grocers. So I, when I see injustice and violence, I throw myself in. And I don't choose a field. I, I protect Earth and I protect people. And out of this appeal grows, you know, it's like my life has been an organic outcome of the defense of the earth and the defense of people. What are my current projects? It, the, I don't work on projects as projects. It's a continuity. We are in a very strange situation. Not only do we have a pandemic, laws are changing by the day. And uh, I've been helping farmers have their own seed sovereignty, food sovereignty. But I realize we now have to create living economies. And this is a very deep part of my work now. How to create, how to go away from the extractive system that takes from the earth, the soil and society to an economy of giving and giving back so that wealth is distributed in society and food is the place to begin. Another very important part of our current work is the Earth University. I mentioned it at the beginning. Do go to the navdanya.org website look at Earth University, read my blogs. And I would suggest many of you students who want to join, you know, till the travel is allowed, join by Zoom. Eventually when the travel is, uh, you know, it, when it's possible physically, we would love to get groups of St. Joseph's to the Earth University, to the beach with their people, where nature is the teacher. It's an amazing biodiversity garden. We've saved thousands of varieties of crops, 750 varieties of rice, 250 varieties of wheat, and you learn then. You learn from nature as a teacher. You learn from biodiversity as a teacher. So let's think of a long-term partnership. You know, my 70s were spent in the St. Joseph's building as I am Bangalore. I would love for the students of that college to start coming to Navdanya when physically it's possible, but look for the courses, sign up for the courses and volunteer. Uh, Ma'am, we'd also like to hear your views on the recent farm bills. What do you think about them? I actually mentioned them in my talk. I mentioned how the 1991 um, structural adjustment of the World Bank. Yeah, At that point, I'd written this book, Globalization of Agriculture, Food Security and Sustainability. 
Yeah, this I think it's these are not available. They're out of print. But I wrote this to um, to analyze the World Bank recipes. Yeah, and this is what the World Bank had had suggested at that time. Yeah. Okay. Liberalize imports, remove land sealing, sub, remove support to farmers, deregulate wheat and rice, dismantle the food security system, remove controls on markets, abolish the Essential Commodities Act, um, and remove inventory controls. So the acts are three, but it is the structural adjustment package of the World Bank of 1991. Okay. And if for those who don't know what the three are, let me just share it with you. The three bills are the Essential Commodities Act Amendment Ordinance, which removes food from regulation of price, which, and this is not related to farmers. This is related to consumers. To, you know, as you'll notice, the price of food is already increasing, yeah? I predict the food price will go so high, people will starve in this country. Your food bills will get more. The Essential Commodities Act is allow corporations to increase the price of staple food. Because Essential Commodities Act regulates the price. Yeah, Removing that regulation means companies can charge what they want. First, they'll take control. Then they'll increase the prices. The second is the Farming Produce Trade and Commerce Promotion and Facilitation Ordinance, which is the dismantling of the system of Mondays. Why is this wrong? The Mondays pay taxes. That's rural development. They build the roads, they build schools. The Monday taxes are a very big rural development fund. Now you've allowed companies to not pay and set up markets where they want to. If they don't pay taxes, they already have cheaper produce. They already have a tax advantage, right? And given the monopoly they have and given the support they get, they will create giant structures. There's already one being created in Moga in Punjab. And the third is what's called the Farmers Empowerment Protection Agreement on Price Assurance and Farm Service. I would just call it corporate slavery. I would just call this one on contract farming, the con corporate slavery law, because Indian farmers are autonomous. It's not by accident that we farmed for 10,000 years. It's not by accident we got rid of Zamidari and created small farm systems again to be food sovereign. This is a Zamidari law. And I must mention that, you know, uh, Montek Singh had given a talk and I have uh, written about this in my book, Make, Making Peace with the Earth. Montek Singh in Dubai had said, very difficult to touch land in India. But I would suggest if you want large land holdings, sign contracts and then you'll get 5,000 farmers land to operate as if it's one land holding. So that's why, and the farmers are smart. They know they say we'll be slaves on our own land in contract farming, yeah? So if you want to understand the three laws, I would say one is read my publications and books. Mm -hmm. I have a book called Who Really Feeds the World? There's a lot in there, Making Peace with the Earth. There's a lot in there, my Green Revolution book. But look at American agriculture and the harm it's done. And look at the brilliance of Indian farming. I want each of you, whether you're faculty or your students, commit yourself to the defense of Indian food, which is healthier for you through any scientific analysis and commit yourself to defending the small farms and the food sovereignty of India. This is the freedom movement of our times. Thank, thank you, ma'am. It was really engaging and inspirational to talk to you. We're very grateful to have listened to you for so long. We'd now like to end the session with the vote of thanks. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Parpaja, for, uh, for moderating the session. Learn to be thankful for what you already have while you pursue all that you want. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to call upon Professor Kiran Jeevan to bring us the vote of thanks. Good evening. Uh, Ma'am, thank you so much for this uh, excellent lecture. And thank you so much for taking time off and for joining us for this first inspirational lecture series. We really appreciate uh, you joining us this evening. And we promise you that we will join your movement 
and okay. uh, take a pledge to save our world and our our community uh, we received 137 questions unfortunately because of lack of time we're not able to ask every question and we also this evening had 513 people join us both on zoom and on youtube thank you very much ma'am for your lecture. my greetings to all of you and let's make sure we protect creation we protect the earth we protect this beautiful land and agriculture is the road to its protection and therefore we must resist this americanization of food and agriculture and they're going to bring a big fraud called fake food from the lab. Oh, there's no food. Let's eat fake food. You know, Bill Gates has 14 patents on Impossible Burger. So real food, real people, real farms, and in India, in resurgence. That is true, Atnir Bhatta. We must each commit ourselves to making India truly Atnir. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I also this evening would like to thank the rector of St. Joseph's College, I also like to express my sincere gratitude to the principal, our registrar, the Department of Economics, Professor Anita Norona and her team, the PR office and our faculty team. And especially this evening, I want to thank all the student interns of the PR office for putting this entire webinar together. Thank you very much. And also the team from the economics department. I also like to thank uh, Dr. Jayati Badra, the HOD of the department of big data analytics for allowing us to use this lab. Thank you very much. Thank you all for joining us this evening. The feedback form is going to be in the description as soon as we finish this program. Thank you very much and God bless all of you and have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you.